Oh, yeah. What's happening, y'all? Thanks for tuning in to the Crash Bang Boom podcast. I'm your host, Jody Smith. Today's guest is drummer Marcus Bryant, who is presently playing with Spirit Adrift and also his other band, Goya. And uh, with Spirit Adrift, I was able to catch up with him on a little tour that they did. Uh, Really, just kind of a one-off show, because they share members uh, with the other band, Gate Creeper. So both bands kind of came into town and played two nights in a row at St. Vitus Bar. Many thanks, as always, to St. Vitus for making so many of these podcasts possible. So it was super cool catching up with Marcus. uh, And Spirit Adrift's new record, Curse of Conception, was on about 50 best of the year lists. So there's a lot of uh, hype going on with them, and uh, it was great seeing them. They definitely delivered, and the album is great. Mark's got some great playing on it as well. But yeah, we get into uh, Arizona summers, riding motorcycles, religious upbringings, and gravitating towards heavy music. Uh, Spirit of Drift going from a one-man band to a full live band, and then uh, Marcus connecting with Metallica at a young age, which ultimately made him want to play drums. Metallica is often one of the gateway bands, it seems. We also talk about record stores and our vinyl collections and uh, the love of just hanging out listening to records and the whole experience of it. Speaking of which, if you're thinking about putting out vinyl for one of your musical projects, look no further than NewOrleansRecordPress.com, my sponsor. You can get all kinds of specific information from the site and get quotes in real time with their quote generator. So go on over to that website, y'all. Check it out. Put out some vinyl. In any case, here we go. Marcus Bryant. Crash, bang, boom. Crowds go mad with joy. All right, Marcus Bryant, what's happening, man? Hey, man, how's it going? Thanks for asking me to do this. Of course, I'm glad to have you on the Crash Bang Boom podcast. Maybe we'll talk about drums, or maybe we'll just talk about our testicles the whole time. That works for me. <laughs> <laughs> so two bands, you're in town right now, a Spirit Adrift. Mm-hmm. Uh, you also play in Goya as well, two different styles, to some degree, mm-hmm. I guess. you know. Uh, yeah. But tell me a little bit about uh, what brought you all to New York, because uh, as I understand, this is sort of a one-off show, but you have shared members, so... Give me the rundown of the incestuous, r- yeah. connected roots of the various bands. All right. We have, um, well, we share uh, members, as I think you know, but I'll say it anyway. So Nate and Chase uh, also play in Gate Creeper. Jeff and I also play in Goya. Um, came out here, I believe, Nate or Chase, because Chase kind of like runs, you know, Gate Creeper and Nate's the the dude for Spirit Adrift. Okay. Um, I think somebody at Revolver um, spoke with our agent. Okay. And just said, hey, we want to do some shows with you guys. Nice. Out in New York and, you know, Spirit Adrift one night, Gate Creeper the other. And, yeah. And uh, asked us to come out, so we said, hell yeah. A night of you double know? dipping. Yes. Fuck yeah. Absolutely, yeah. And I guess it bears mentioning that y'all are all from Arizona. Yes. Uh, based out of Arizona, somewhere between, base, I guess, Phoenix and Tucson. Yep. Yeah, most of us are uh, most of us are Phoenix. Two of the guys from Gate Creeper still live in Tucson. Yeah. I talked to uh, the drummer, Zach Simmons, of uh, Goat Horror, who was originally okay. from Phoenix. I think he mm-hmm. still lives in Phoenix, possibly. I'm pretty sure he still does. I see him at shows from time to time. Okay. Yeah. 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 And uh, my mom lived in Tucson for a while, like I was telling you, and I loved going out there, hanging out downtown and fucking bar hopping and doing the whole mm-hmm. thing. Tucson's such a cool town. But my God, man, Phoenix, uh, I'm from Louisiana, so it's a different kind of We're heat. In New Orleans and I have family there. Southeast. No shit. I love New Orleans more than any city. <laughs> I do. I love it. Yeah. yeah. It's the northernmost Caribbean city uh, is one yeah. way of looking at it. Yeah. Yeah. It's got a strange... Has that French influence. Yeah. yeah. Spanish. Uh, it's, yeah. It's, 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 it's all over the mm-hmm. place. It's a fucking great city. But uh, the heat down there is a different thing, whereas the humidity there could be oh. a brutal thing. But... That whole dry desert shit y'all deal with in Phoenix is a whole nother ordeal itself. It's rough. Yeah, yeah. 
Like, I don't know which is worse. Like, it's like when I'm in Phoenix, I want the humidity, say, yeah. like New Orleans. But then if I'm in New Orleans in the summer, I'm just like, dude, shoot me. Like, yeah. It's, well, the one thing is that at least at night with the dry heat, it, it can cool down. It can, yeah. Whereas at night in New Orleans, you go out, you're going to be sweating. Yeah. Still, still sweating. I, <laughs> I do that aspect of it I prefer because that I can take a shower and still feel like I showered an hour later if exactly. I'm not moving in yeah. Phoenix. Like, just go from, like, you right. know, your house to the car to someone else's house. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So you were you born and raised? You were originally from Arizona? No. I am I'm from Dallas. No shit. Born in Dallas. Um, like I said, I had family in New Orleans. I had okay. family. My dad's from Georgia. Nice. So we all moved out west. Uh, like I went to high school in Flagstaff. I went to like some grade school there too. So what? Yeah. Uh, what brought you to? How'd you end up in Arizona? Um, my dad got a new job. So just like, you know, parents said, "Hey, we're gonna work out here now," and the kids <laughs> are forced to go along. What age were you? I was. I would have been eight when I moved to Arizona. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, like we lived in a small town called Sedona for like a few months. Then we moved to Flagstaff. And still like that shock to me was like I went from this like from Dallas. Right. To like a small mountain town in northern Arizona. And was just, like, Sedona, I, I have yet shit. to go there, but I have a friend that, that went out there. He had one of the weirdest jobs where he's for a summer he was a balloon wrangler. Like hot air balloon oh, yeah. rides. They do all those tours there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So he would like wrangle, tie him off. So he was like a fucking hot air balloon mm-hmm. wrangler. And then had another buddy that, that was out there like doing massage and shit. And it sounds like it's just, yeah. it's one of those strange energy vortexes of the fucking it desert. It is, yeah. Because my mom would be like, there's a lot of new age stuff out there. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, oh, yes, there yeah. is. Because, yeah, we're like, it was like a southern family. We went to like Baptist and Lutheran churches. And they're like, now be careful. Right. There's new age <laughs> <laughs> shit <laughs> whatever <laughs> wow man so what was your do you recall your first summer in in, in uh, Arizona in Phoenix I guess what you got Phoenix, there Phoenix my grandparents live in Phoenix okay. so we'd go out from Dallas like when we still lived in Dallas and visit them and I always remember hating Phoenix <laughs> yeah. um and it's just like a it's a drier Dallas like the cities are very similar but right. um I always said I would never live there Really, and that's and I've lived in Phoenix now since 2001. So, like, I moved to LA. I lived in Vegas for. I moved all over. So, Phoenix for yeah since 01 now, and I still have yet to get used to the summers there. Really, so it's always nice touring um, right through the summer. Just get the hell out. It's, Absolutely, nobody does anything. Yeah, like you can't. Like everyone else is like, like I ride motorcycles a lot, right? Yeah. So everyone else is like, woohoo, summer riding, and that's when I garage mine. It's like I ride in the winter <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when it's like 70 degrees yeah. out in Phoenix. Yeah. So the winters are great. The summers, they're, they're pretty you, brutal. You go outside. Yeah. It's, it's a whole nother, nother, it's just a whole nother environment out there. It's rough. Yeah. When you're, when you're hitting like 120 and you're just like, what am, yeah. what do you do? <laughs> <laughs> when did you start riding motorcycles? Um, I rode dirt bikes growing up. Oh, um, shit. Yeah. I didn't get like a, like a cruiser until... What would that be? It would only be about five, six years now. Really? So not, not, a, not a very long time. Uh, but, you know, if we put drumming, you know, at a 10, I'd say riding motorcycles is like a 9.5. Oh, that's close. Like it immediately was like, this is the greatest thing ever. Really? Yeah. I, I love it. That's wild, man. And you, you've been fortunate enough to not have any accidents, knock on wood, thus far? I've been hit by one car, and it was, it was minor enough uh, to where I'm still riding. Uh, wow. Yeah, yeah. My grandfather, not so much minor. He died on one. He drove straight oh, off the shit. side of a mountain. That's terrible. And I grew up riding him with my dad. Did you? Yeah. Okay. And all of his friends got fucked up uh, at yeah. one point or another. One one hit a deer. Mm-hmm. Uh, another one uh, just, yeah, yeah. So it's it's crazy, man. Be careful is the moral yeah. of that story. You wear a helmet? I do wear a helmet. Do you wear a full face helmet? I wear a full face helmet. Good call, my yes, man. Yes, I do. We don't have to. Arizona's like, whatever. There's no helmet laws. Right. I didn't for the first year. That's and probably the worst time to not wear a helmet. Oh, 110%, my man. But I was just like, oh, this feels way too good. And then <laughs> I was finally like, this is dumb. Yeah. Like, going 85 with sunglasses on. Like, right. if you go down, you know, that's it. Oh, man. Like, yeah, I wear, I wear the full helmet. I do get the fascination with it, with getting wind in your face and the mm-hmm. feeling of freedom that comes with it. Uh, yeah. I've been riding my bicycle, uh, knock on wood as well, uh, that uh, I have not had any major uh, problems as mm-hmm. of yet, but I've been riding bikes in and out of the city for 
I guess the last 10 years. Yeah. And I do I do love it. When I get on my bike, I always uh, I always feel a little little taste of freedom, getting yeah. some wind in the face. No, it's like flying. Nothing really touches it. No, it's great. It's different from playing drums or playing music, but like, but it's almost equally as enjoyable, just in a different way. Yeah. Yeah. I do like the idea of being able to go pretty a little bit faster than I've been going. So at some point or another, yeah. I think when I move out of the city, I, the plan is to get a motorcycle. I do yeah, want to get nice. one. Yeah. yeah, it'd be a different beast here. Yeah. You guys can't... Well, nobody can split lanes, I guess, other than California, so... Yeah, I mean, it's it's crazy. Uh, one of my exes was from Colombia, and uh, I, I went down there and drove down in South mm-hmm. America and Colombia. Dude, you should see how people ride motorcycles down there, really? dude. Yeah. Oh, it's crazy. Talk about splitting lanes. It's like... It's no holds barred. It's just, just insanity. It's just whatever they want to do. Constant insanity. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, that's insane. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see that. <laughs> the pace of it is is fascinating to see mm-hmm. it. And, and no matter what, it's just people get those things just for that so they can mm-hmm. bypass traffic. Because traffic is actually so bad in at least Bogota mm-hmm. uh, that if you have a car, you, you can't drive it seven days a week. You, they give you like a, a stamp, you know, or whatever. And then that's, that's you ha- you, it alternates okay. days. Oh, wow. That's how much, that's how crowded and how bad traffic is there. No shit. So then wow. to, to counteract that, you got a bunch of locals jumping on these little dirt bikes and whatever else and splitting lanes and driving mm-hmm. like bats out of hell. Yeah. It's wild, dude. That is wild. <laughs> Maybe one of your bands will go down there and Some, then you remember Jody Smith told me Jody they Smith, drive yeah. like fucking maniacs. I want to rent a motorcycle here and I'm going to try and participate. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Go yeah. for it. Yeah. Man. Yeah. yeah. Tell me a little bit more uh, about Spirit of Drift. Uh, this is the second full link that you put out in 2017? It's our second full link, yeah. Got you. Um, came out October 6th. There you go. You got um, dates and everything stored away. Look at dates you. Dates stored away, yeah. that's <laughs> Nobody helped me with that, I promise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, it hasn't even been out that long. And yeah. It's, uh, it was just kind of blown away at um, all the great press it's getting. Yeah. Like, we were all like, like we all felt like... When we were recording it, we did it with Sanford Parker uh-huh. um, at a studio in Phoenix. Uh, the studio's called Villain Recording. Um, we, we felt like, like we were kind of looking at each other and we're like, Is it, this feels really special. It feels like we were like really uh-huh. capturing something awesome. And I think Nate at some point asked Sanford, he's like, this is like really special. Are we crazy? Or, you know, because, you know, he's recording bands all, sure. all year long. And he said it just, something felt really good about it, you know, so... Uh, it's been well received and yeah we're just kind of riding it right now you know absolutely it's been awesome to the extent that y'all flew up for a one-off gig up here and double yeah. dip in two nights hanging out in new york that's pretty fucking cool it's awesome yeah yeah we did uh we got we flew out to denver at one point so we've flown out for flown out for a couple gigs now it's Very pretty cool, cool to be able to do that you know well how did you end up joining this band in the first place i was playing in another band that's that's not around anymore in phoenix um Nate was playing in another band as well. I mean, we all kind of, you know, you play music and you kind of get to know everyone in the scene and you see people around. Um, I heard the first full length come out when Nate released it. Um, He released the EP in the full length. Uh And I just sent him a message on Facebook because I was like, whoa, this shit's like, this is awesome. And it was a one man band at the time. He played everything on the first two releases. so I shot him a message, just like, hey, man, I love what you're doing. This is awesome. Yeah. Just kind of like putting it out there. You know? Yeah. <laughs> and he responds back with, uh, you know, thank you so much. Maybe someday you'll be playing drums on it. And I was like, hell that's, yeah. That's cool. Uh, so from what it sounds like, talking to him now after being in the band, he was kind of scouting us all out ah. uh, for a while. You know, like that drummer, you know, that guitarist, you know, uh-huh. like he kind of had all of this this going he'd seen me in old bands and you know uh-huh just kind of he just he picked everyone he wanted you know yeah yeah that's very cool yeah 
And now, I guess, uh, once you got in the band, um, I, I would kind of describe it. Uh, we were talking a little bit about it earlier. I would say that, that with... Uh, with Spirit of Drift, it's kind of uh, doomy yet has has like a proggy or thrash element to it, uh, yeah. as opposed to I guess Goya, which you were saying is more kind of straight ahead, kind of doomy Black Sabbathy kind of stuff. Yeah. Was uh, was it at all a stretch uh, for you to play with Spirit of Drift, or is it is it been? Did you feel right at home? Initially? I felt right at home. Um, I played in a lot of like really fast. Like I used to play in a lot of death metal bands and like okay. black metal bands and stuff. Um, and playing in playing in this kind of music, my home's oh my heart has always been in like blues. Yeah. Because I was raised, my dad was in like blues and soul and yeah. R and B records. So groove has always been my number one thing. Yeah. Um, so when I heard this stuff, when I heard like Spirit of Drift, um, it kind of like I don't know. It was nice to return to that. And uh-huh. just to like slow down, and I'm not running a marathon behind the kit anymore. Right. You know, there's dynamics in the playing. Um, it's it's so much fun to play this this kind of music. I bet. So, yeah. Uh, starting off, if you were playing death metal and black metal and all that stuff, uh, at which point did you start even getting into heavy music and ultimately kind of more extreme forms of it? Um, I have I have always been a metalhead. Um, yeah. I was I was. What uh, was your first like? What was your first recording that you got? That was the, and at what age? The first one was. Oh shit. It was when we had moved to Northern Arizona. My oldest sister, she's four years older than me to the day, and I would go in her room and steal her her cassette tapes. Uh huh. Um, and she had like all this shit that I just I didn't like. She had like Motley Crue, Poison, and just none of that really like spoke all the to hair me. Hair metal. Yeah. And I took. I still have the this exact this very cassette still. Hold on to it. I took uh, Metallica's Black album. Uh huh. I put it on. Man, how old was I? It would have been early 90s. It was early 90s, for yeah. sure. And I put it on, and I was just like, it was the first thing I ever heard where it was like, this is my music, you know, yeah, yeah. where I, like, I really identified with it. Um, so it started there. Yeah. And then, just like a lot of people, I think like most people, I was just like, anything and everything I could get my hands on. Like, we lived in Flagstaff at the time, small town, so like, everything I got through... Remember Columbia House? Like 12 Absolutely. CDs for one cent? That was the weirdest shit. I still don't understand. Because you could, you could get them and then cancel it, right? So you, yeah, could, you, could, you could get pull scams a penny and, and just pay for shipping and get like 12 CDs yeah. or 12 cassettes. Yeah. yeah. But I did that. So I'd get like bands from just off the description or the album right. art, you know, and then like metal magazines. I very quickly just uh, actually told this story earlier. Um, I went into, uh, we had this local record shop called Go For Sounds. It's shut down now. Mm -hmm. And the owner there, I think his name was Steve, cool as shit. Um, I went in and I was like, hey, you know when like, I don't remember how I was like so young. (laughs) I was like, you know when Metallica's old? Yeah. I was like, are there any bands that like do that all the time? He's like, that's growling. You want death metal? I was like, death metal. I'd never heard that in my <laughs> oh, life. Shit, I had a, no that's awesome. fucking idea what he was talking about. <laughs> um, and he takes me over and he picked up Dismember's massive killing capacity, huh. and he just handed it to me. And I was like, all right. So I like put it on, and I was like, it just like blew my mind. And I was just like, I should know. My mom would kill me. She'd like light this CD on fire. Yeah. Um, and I just went crazy. Like I was. Pantera is probably one of my all-time favorite bands, period. Fuck yeah, no Just, doubt. Like, straight up. Uh, I don't know why kids don't like them. Like, they're not, like, cool. And right. And fuck them, it's their loss. Like, yeah, yeah. Um, and it was, it, it was Pantera, and then it was everyone, my brother and I would listen to our favorite band's favorite bands. Uh-huh. Or, like, whenever they're wearing a shirt. That you're was like, well, always a that? way to know about it, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, like, you know, you'd see, like, Phil wearing, like, an I Hate God shirt. I'm like, I Hate God, I gotta check that out. Crowbar, right. who's that? You yeah, know? yeah. Yeah. Um, him, by him wearing those those shirts totally. and that video alone definitely helped both of those bands yeah. out immensely. Yeah. And the first time, I hate to say it because they're like, I have a huge I Hate God tattoo. They're one of my very favorite bands. I've, I've uh, got to tell you, I've got I Hate God. I saw them like in like 91. 90, oh, yeah. <laughs> you saw like you saw I Hate God. Yeah. You saw I Hate God. I saw it a long <laughs> yeah. time ago, yeah. man. Uh, <laughs> first time I heard them, I wasn't ready for Mike's vocals. And I was young. I didn't like it at first. I didn't get yeah. it. Like, I, w- I was moving, like, towards, like, really fast. Yeah, more technical you know? stuff. Yeah, and now it was like, I was just like, eh. 
But then, yeah, I revisited older. I was like, what the fuck was I thinking? Well, those recordings are also, they sound fucking crazy. They They're do. real, like, lo-fi and dirty. Yeah. And it kind of, it, but it makes sense. I love it so much, though, yeah. And the weird thing about it is, and I've talked to guys about it on the podcast and just some of my New Orleans friends and everything, you have to consider with them that them being I Hate God, that everything that was kind of going on in the city at the time was not that. It was like shell shock, mm-hmm. exhorter. It was a lot of thrash. That's what was going on. Yeah. And then at some point they just, I don't know how conscious it was. I don't know if they talked about it necessarily. Mm-hmm. I've had both Aaron, uh, the new drummer on the podcast, and Jimmy Bauer. And I actually never did quite, I don't think I ever asked them if it was a conscious decision to play a certain way. But Jimmy has said that I, I know that the Melvins had something to do with yeah. it. And when they heard that how slow you can you go shit, yep. uh, then I guess a couple with some of the because there is sort of a bluesy progression that they totally employ yeah. in their music which is funny you wouldn't necessarily think that at, mm-hmm. at face value but uh you can hear that with those new orleans bands that, right that huge influence that like blues and jazz had on their playing yeah funk yeah. all kinds of shit yeah. but uh it, the it, meters it, right <laughs> yeah but it's amazing i can tell you one thing man when i saw i got in 1991 and they scared me out of the room that they played in within about a song and a half oh, shit, the yeah. last thing that i thought was that 20 some odd years later they would still be doing it it's so awesome. It's insane, man. 30 years, I guess. Because I think that was like 80, 88, well, I think. Oh, is when shit. Now, yeah, 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 you're right. Yeah, Holy so 30. Fuck. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> it's like crazy. Or something like that. Yeah. It's close. Yeah, it's you close can, to that. You can't, you can't fuck with that band. <laughs> like, man, Joey's drumming. And Aaron's great, too. The new guy. He's so good. Yeah. But like, Joey's like ability to like drag a rhythm through the mud and it sound perfect. Yeah. And fluctuate tempo the way he did, like so badass like yeah that's i don't know it's great it's very uh it's very counter to so much modern music you know between everything being so quantized Mm -hmm. and and sound replaced and pitch shifted and fucking midi replaced and Mm -hmm. you know you name it every studio trick and that that's just kind of like this organic muddy heavy crazy thing that they that they did that's very much their own Mm -hmm. it's wild yeah they're they're one of a kind for sure (laughs) but yeah it was it was them later but like i started with death metal was probably my second love very quickly followed by my brother brought home my younger brother he brings home we were just buying everything and he brought home dark thrones transylvanian hunger and he's like have you heard of black metal and i was like what the fuck is black yet metal? again yet another subgenre. You're like yeah. what and he brought home that i'm wearing a fucking shirt aren't i yeah. yes i am all right <laughs> he he brought that home and we looked at the cover and i was just like whoa that's fucking intense put it on and we're like it like blew our minds i was just like this is the most evil shit (laughs) i have ever ever heard yeah and like being raised in like a religious that's exactly where i was going with this and then i heard that i was like this is it if you thought your 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 parents were going to freak out about the death metal they were they would definitely freak that much about it and it was like like love at first listen man and it's I love black metal so much. Really? Yeah. yeah. Do you feel like part of what you love about it is that it's so counter to the the environment that you grew up in? Um, initially, yeah. Initially, um, that was a big part of it. Now, I just think that aspect of it is, it's just fun. It's just, it's a part of it. And I do love that, that um, the imagery and the subject matter yeah. um, that a lot of the bands have. Yeah. But now, like, it's really, it's just, it's that sound, man. It's just that that wall of sound the tremolo picking just the uh, that wall of just the blasting you know it's it's just the best yeah i love black metal so much Going back for a second to when you mentioned uh, going to the record store and the guy mm-hmm. hipping you to shit, it's so that's cool that that you experienced that because I can tell you're probably a pretty good good bit younger than me because I mean if mm-hmm. the Black album was the first one you got hip to, I saw them on that tour. Okay, so, so I'm 41. You're 41. I'm 36. Okay, so I'm not that much older than yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because I didn't get that tape right when it came out. That would have gotcha, been what gotcha. 91. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would have been 10. Right. 
Yeah, I must have been. I was probably 11 or 12 or something. Okay. I don't remember, to be honest. Yeah. I just remember the damn tape. Right. <laughs> That's awesome. But, I yeah. mean, it is what a far-removed world it is. And it's coming back now. I think mm-hmm. it's cool. Although, I would say, in my general experience of going to record stores, the dudes mm-hmm. that run them are kind of, more often than not, kind of pricks these days. Yeah, they seem like <laughs> At least disinterested. In yeah, yeah, they're just like, why are you asking me about this? And it's like, yeah. well, because when I was a kid, I used to go and the guys would be able to tell you about music. And yeah. so it was it was like a the, the audible library. You could go mm-hmm. and some dude could tell you about all kinds of shit you didn't yeah. know about, i.e. the way that you found out about death metal. Yeah. So it's cool that, that you know, we actually got to experience that. Mm-hmm. To have that, yeah, that aspect of being exposed to music, that, that I guess that way of being exposed to music. Right. And through... I mean, they're gone now, I guess. Metal Maniacs magazine, Pit magazine, I think Metal Edge. I didn't like Metal Edge as much. Metal Maniacs yeah. was like heavier, more extreme. And just, I we just buy shit out of the back, you know? Right. Like just ordering tapes <laughs> blindly. <laughs> yeah. Just like, who the, like, uh, Cryptopsy? I had no fucking idea who that was. I just ordered that because it right. was in a little ad in the back of Metal Maniacs, you know? I mean, you got a lot of shit that way too, but like. Yeah. You yeah. Every now and again, you find a gym. Yeah, totally. Yeah, and it's and and I do miss that. Yeah. Yeah, record stores they don't seem maybe it's my age. I don't know if it's <laughs> like you just like dude like what's a you know, I don't know. Yeah. Nobody I, helps you anymore. <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah, yeah. It is it is definitely it's obviously a different world and it's it's a crazy it's it's cool that the resurgence of vinyl is doing yes. what it's doing for many reasons cuz one it's it's awesome to listen to mm-hmm. to albums uh, out on actual vinyl yeah. on systems like that. Yeah. But uh it, it is cool that I think, and hopefully, you know, like we've talked about, some of the interaction will change with the people that maybe run record stores. Mm-hmm. But for kids coming in that can be hip to all kinds of shit, uh, similar to what, what we were experiencing, you know? Because, yeah. I mean, obviously, if you were born in the age of the Internet, your access to information and how you find out this information and the mm-hmm. instantaneous access to it yeah. is such a completely fucking different world totally than pre-Internet. Different. Yeah. yeah. We lived in the woods outside of Flagstaff. <laughs> Yeah, that's why I like black metal. There was a, we were in the woods and there was a mountain right there. Yeah. So it's the aesthetic made sense. Pre- predisposed <laughs> to like in Vikings <laughs> yeah, and yeah. lonely dark woods. But yeah, it was like, we were like, my brother and I were like cut off from all that. So it was just yeah. like, I was the older brother. I didn't have any, like I had a buddy who was more into punk. So it was just kind of like, it's what the record store could get. It's what I read in magazines. And we were just hungry for it. So right. it was like... And we had, I remember when we got our first 96K modem. Some people probably don't even know what the fuck that is. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. just like the infancy of the internet. But there was nothing, there wasn't music on the internet right. back then in the 90s. It was just like, okay, here's this thing nobody knows what to do with right now. But yeah. Like, yeah, music was through tape trading and reading fucking liner notes. I've heard a million people say it, but that's how I grew up too. With like listening to the album, looking at the artwork, reading the lyrics. Right reading all the liner notes like shit's awesome it's a totally different experience of just having that physical representation to to mm-hmm. correspond to what you're listening to yeah is an awesome thing and like you said i mean at the time when i when i was young it would it would be like well that that cover art looks cool i guess i'll totally. get that i do you know that's that. how you would you yeah. would, you would pick shit out mm-hmm. and i mean try to try telling that to someone once again that's yeah. significantly younger than you and it's like you that's see it like on a cube on their computer yeah yeah phone. exactly yeah. i don't like that thumbnail yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think, like, yeah, I, to- I bought so many albums based off the artwork alone. Just you'd be in the metal section, you'd just be like, well, shit, that's crazy, you know? Like, that's, yeah, that's, a, that's how we did it. I have a funny dial-up internet story, I'll tell you. Uh, I interviewed uh, Ryan Legs Leger. He played uh, in Every Time I Die. And okay, did, yeah. Uh, did in another band that recently that I, t- I talked to him about. And he was telling me, like, when they first got dial-up internet, he's, he's uh, originally from Canada. Mm-hmm. And uh, he was said uh, they were trying to f- uh, look at a picture of Kate Winslet's boobs uh-huh. uh, around the Titanic time or whatever. Mm-hmm. And they were like, all right, all right, here we go. Everybody gathered around the computer. And it was just like, eh, slowly. Dip, dip, yeah, and then he was dip, like, the parents, dip. like, Dr- drove up the drive. He's like, "Fuck, we haven't even seen the tits yet. It We're still waiting. Come on, come on, come on!" Yeah. Just wanted to see some tits. It's barely gotten to her forehead because <laughs> the picture takes forever to load down. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, just zigzagging its way. Yeah, and yeah, man. Good old times, that man. Was, that was good old days, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it's great now. Like, I, I love having every single thing on my library on my phone. Yeah, but like, I have tons of vinyl at home. Like, that's my yeah. preferred way of listening for sure. 
Absolutely. You're more engaged. You got to go over flip the record halfway through. You right. Know? Exactly. It's it's great. Yeah. And I think you're more prone, hopefully, uh, to getting records that are uh, put together well in the sense of, uh, I guess, just the continuity of the songs and the sequencing of it. So you actually mm-hmm. want to listen to it in yeah. its entirety. Oh yeah, I'm which, definitely an album guy. Yeah, I want to listen because that's that's one of my favorite pieces of uh, my favorite parts of putting. A piece of music together, put an album together, is then going, okay. How do we now, sequence it? How do we sequence this? If it wasn't written that way, which a lot of times it is. So putting the album together in that sequence is probably my favorite, one of my favorite parts. Yeah. It's like, how do we, oh shit, this ends in this key, so we'll start this song, you know, whatever. Sure. You know? Yeah, I've, uh, I've been editing and working in television forever, so I, I uh, as well, I like arranging songs mm-hmm. and I like thinking about the sequencing of them. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. like, that's kind of where the more fun of it is. Yeah. No, that's a cool <laughs> part of it for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Well, drumming wise, man, uh, I don't think we even talked about it. So you, you're getting into all this dark, crazy shit. You're, mm-hmm. you're you're feeling probably fairly guilty the fact that you listen to black metal coming from a semi-religious household. Oh, and then man. it's <laughs> <That's> so good. <laughs> and then at some point you what end a up... great memory. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about your childhood yeah, guilt, yeah. big guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when when did you start playing drums? Started playing drums. I joined the school band. In sixth grade, sixth grade, we started playing, you know, the snare drum in the back of the it's of the, the band room. That's the way it goes many times. I yeah. started there myself. Yeah, so that was that was the start, and I and I knew immediately. I mean, I knew from the first time I heard uh, the Black Album, like Lars made me want to play the drums. That's awesome because. Because when I hear it, I'm like, I think I could do that. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Not dissing, but right. I'm just like, he he made he well, made it, was it very attainable. Straight. Very straight. Very straight. Very yeah. straight playing on that. Um, and it's just so fucking badass. Yeah. Like that that thing that most drummers know. You just go da 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 da, and everyone already knows what song that is. Right. You know. Well, it is interesting because uh, as well, I think one of the reasons why I'm just t- taking a stab here at her, at least from my perspective, was mm-hmm. that I do remember, once again, when the Black Album first came out, I, it, everyone was listening to it. But the interesting thing is when I listened to other albums that came around that time, be it mm-hmm. Pantera or whatever, the Black Album sounds the best out of all of the records that came out at that time. So yeah. I, I think for, for, for me... When I heard it, I remember thinking, or more, it's more in hindsight now, and then mm-hmm. I think more about production and what goes into yeah. records, but I think that was one of the biggest sounding metal records to that date. Yeah. I don't know that a okay. record sounded bigger than that. Yeah, that makes sense, yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. looking back, it's like, I haven't listened to that album in a while, but yeah, it sounds huge. The production is flawless, which I know a lot of people hate about it. Right. Um, I mean, my favorite Metallica album would actually be Master. Oh, yeah, same here. Yeah, okay, yeah. But uh, no, yeah, it does. The production was wild on that thing. It's huge. It's crazy. Yeah. All right, sorry, we deviated for yeah, a second. Yeah, we did. So we, did. So <laughs> um, we digress. Lars made drumming attainable to you. Yeah, he made me want to play, join a school band in sixth grade, and then got my first drum kit in eighth grade. I don't know why it took so long, because uh, I have a musical family. Like, everyone in my family plays music, with the exception of my father. Really? Uh, my two older sisters and my younger brother as well. Yeah, everyone plays an instrument. Oh, wow. Um, I grew up in an incredibly unmusical family on both you? sides. Okay. I think I'm literally the first on either side to oh, ever play wow. an instrument. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so I'm the totally upper other end of the spectrum. Yeah, like I had my older sister plays piano, my other sister plays the harp. Okay. So it's a very musical house, um, and my brother and I were just like, we want to play this stuff, you know, like yeah. that we're listening to. So, yeah, I got a drum kit in uh, eighth grade, and just like, that was just it. That's that's what I did, you know, like just being in Flagstaff, like just like buying buying every CD I could and trying to play it on drums, you know. Yeah. The first song I ever played with my brother was Orgasmatron by Motorhead. No shit, that's yes. awesome. That was the first thing. we He played bass. That was his first instrument. Um, 
the brotherly rhythm section. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. fucking cool. I mean, he plays like twelve fucking instruments now, but um, <laughs> and he's incredible at all of them. Uh, but yeah, yeah, we were like, I think I can do this, you know, just da na 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 na, you know. Yeah. Uh, that was that was the very first song. That's cool. Yeah, and then we would just learn. Like, where, like, Lars made me want to play the drums, then I got into Sabbath, and, like, Bill Ward was, like, my second thing to tackle when I was learning the instrument. So I went from learning Metallica songs to, and, like, that was the only Motorhead song. I wish I could say I learned more, but I didn't. Um, Once you start getting into Bill Ward, then you're talking about more swinging and, yeah. and more ghost notes mm -hmm. and all that. So yeah. that's, that's, then you're getting jazz, blues, groove, rock. Yeah. Everything. Which is what I grew up growing up on blues and and, yeah. and soul and all of that. It all tied back together. Yeah, yeah. And hearing like my mother would like listen to like gospel music and stuff. So all that it was all about feel. Yeah. So it was when I got into like Sabbath, like there was more of that there. And then it was like Danzig. We learned like old Danzig. Oh stuff. yeah. Chuck Biscuits been on those first yeah. two records. Yeah, I remember playing Twist of Cain when I was a little Fuck kid yeah. with, my, with my brother. Yeah. Oh yeah, dude. Yeah, yeah. So that was like that's where it all started. And then, and then, even though Dismember was my first death metal band, my friend brought over Morbid Angel's Domination. Oh, and boy. And he put on Where the Slime Live. That was the first song I ever heard by them. And I was like, I need fucking double bass pedals now. <laughs> <laughs> like, I want to do that. Like, yeah. Just that. You know, of just course. Like, oh, man. <laughs> Yeah, that was a total different beast when I was, like, trying to, like, play death metal, you know, as, like, a little kid. Because you get so frustrated. You're like, God damn it. Like, how are they doing this? You know, yeah. You're like, sound like shit, you know? Like, I had a drum teacher for, like, a couple months, and then he died. Oh, really? Yeah, he fucking... Well, how'd he die? He, uh, car accident. Oh, damn, really? Yeah, so it was like... Was he a good teacher? He, he mean... was fucking great. Oh, okay. He, he told me probably the most important thing as a drummer that was ever told to me was I went in and I had been playing for I think I'd been playing for a couple of years at this yeah. point maybe not maybe I don't know I had been playing for a little while um, and decided I wanted to like you know try to take some lessons my brother was taking lessons from somebody yeah and and so he had me just play shit I like and whatever I like um, so you could see like where I was at and he told me he said, you have a natural feel that cannot be taught. Mm -hmm. So if you stick with this, I think you can be a great drummer someday. And that wow. just never left. So that was always... So when I'd get like frustrated or whatever, I was like, well, this guy who's fucking badass. Yeah. Um, you know, like, I guess, believed in me as a drummer. How much later did he pass after he told you that? It would have been in that same year. Oh, man, that's crazy. Um, yeah. So, and I just never took lessons after that. No shit. The thing we were working on when he died is, oh, man, I got to fucking bring this band up, um, <laughs> was 46 and 2 by Tool. Okay. Um, and I was just, just getting into that. Um, but that's not really my style of playing. So, who no, had he not died, I might be a totally different drummer. Interesting. You know, I, like, probably. I don't know. Right. Like, I didn't like listening to that as much, so maybe not. But, it, you know, I would definitely sound different. Like, my approach to writing a song from a drummer's perspective would be t totally different. It very well could have, because, I mean, with the Tool stuff, everything that, that Danny does, more or less, is has uh, based around all these kind of strange linear patterns, mm -hmm. and it gets super analytical and yeah. quite complex. Yeah, I definitely do not play like that. <laughs> it's amazing. I... I, I I fucking love his drumming, but at the end of the day, for me, it's groove sure. and it's feel because of what I was, you know, what I heard my dad listen to as a little kid. You I'm know? the same way, so yeah. I hear you. John Bonham. Fuck yeah, man. Like, period. I guess you it, just it, say his name and that's, who gives a shit? Bam. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, between the two bands that you're playing with right now, do you, you have the same kit and it, and it wor works for both both bands sonically i do i actually have john bonham's ludwig <laughs> speaking of john bonham no shit i have the ludwig uh, the 26 inch kick drum 14 by 26 and then uh well i guess the earlier bonham because i have the 10 by 14 rack tom uh -huh. he ended up getting that ridiculously right it's hard but yeah 14 16 18 nice i have that in vista light and their classic maple so oh, that's awesome i got a vista light kit as well dude they're so awesome i love they're them so man. loud <laughs> that's what's that's what's killer about yeah them. They're kind of one-trick ponies, man. I don't mm -hmm. know. But, I mean, I think if it's rock, blues, R&B, fucking whatever, you mm -hmm. can, they, they, they do they work, work in that environment. Yeah. 
Yeah, the, yeah. It's like I think you could. Yeah, I think you could play just about anything on those. Like, yeah. I would never record on them. I've never recorded Vista Light because it's so bright. Well, John Bonham didn't either. Yeah, because the know. wood you got that warmth. Yeah. That. Yeah, you right. can't replicate with with Vista Light. So yeah, it's uh, for live. I usually play my Vista Light kit. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. Just to cut through, especially in Goya, to cut through, because it's Goya's the loudest fucking thing I've ever done. <laughs> really. It's ridiculous. You wear earplugs, don't you? I do. Okay. I do, yes. I always Good. have. That, that's, I'm doing one thing right. Right, right, yeah. right. I always say I was never the best with safe sex, but I did do hearing but protection. Did, but safe listening, I guess, or playing <laughs> or whatever. Right. Yeah, yeah. I was like, you know what? The dick may fall off, but I'm keeping my but eardrums. I'm keeping this. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Shit, man. Well, uh, what's going on in 2018? I mean, I know y'all just put out this record, uh, came up here for this one-off. Uh, do y'all have any other tours lined up or any particular thing that you're looking forward to for the re- for as we are? We're, we're in the infancy of the year, but... Yeah, we are. Um, yeah, we have. We just announced we're doing some dates with Paul Bearer nice. uh, later in the year. That's going around the Decibel uh, Music and Beer Fest that we're playing this year. Pretty excited about that. Um, we're playing... Trying to think of, I don't want to say things that haven't been announced yet. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> we're playing um, Migration Fest. Yeah, that's been announced. Yeah, yeah. Um, Psycho Las Vegas. Um, so you got some shit lined up. And we got some more shit in the works too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's 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 looking good so far. Yeah. All right. Uh, it'll be a busy year for us. That's exciting, man. Yeah. Well, shit, man. Thanks for talking to me. I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, if y'all come back through, uh, I, we'll, we'll have to catch up. For sure, yeah. Right it's on. Been great. Thank you for. Uh, thanks again for doing this. Absolutely, man. Yeah. Thanks for tuning in, y'all. And thanks to Marcus for hanging and talking shit. Check out Spirit of Drifter Goya if you get a chance. Buy some of them tracks. Rock them. Play them loud. Spin them. Kill them. Thrill them. And I loved the uh, the story about his deceased drum teacher and the words of wisdom that he got. That's a pretty awesome story. That about does it for this one. We'll catch you on the next one. Crash, bang, boom.